Before discussing the binary phase diagrams and the isomorphous phase diagram, it is necessary to review the solubility in solid solution and also review the definition of solid solution and phase. So solid solutions formed when the solute atoms are added to the host material. Then the crystal structure of the host material is maintained, and there's no new structure or no new composition are formed, then we have a solid solution. A phase is a homogeneous portion of a system that has uniform physical and chemical characteristics. Well, later you will see another term which is called a second phase. So while the solute atoms are added, new compounds or structure may form beyond solubility limit. So the solubility limit we learned from last class is a maximum concentration of solute atoms that may dissolve in the solvent to form a solid solution. So when that solubility limit is reached and when we are still adding or we continue to add more solute atoms, this solute atom will precipitate out or there will be a new structure form which is distinct from a previous structure. So this will be a new phase or a second phase. Back in chapter four, when we learn the point defects in the material and introduce the impurity atoms in the material and also how to form solid solutions, we mentioned this hume Ruthery rules which described or listed the conditions that an alloy or ceramic system must meet if the system is to display unlimited solid solubility, which means no matter how much sol solute atoms we're going to add into the solvent, all of the solute atoms will dissolve into the solvent. So that is the unlimited sol solid solubility. So this rules, including the atomic radius, the size of both atoms. So the size should be very close. The differences should be within 15%. And both, both atoms should have the similar electro, electron negativities and same crystal structure for pure metals. When all else being equal, number one through three are equal, then we need to check the valency. A metal will have a greater tendency to dissolve a metal of higher valency than one of lower valency. One of the most simplest alloy system that has the unlimited solid solubility is the nickel copper system or nickel copper solid solution, but actually it's just an alloy, right? So both nickel and copper has FCC crystal structure and the electron activity are very close, 1.9 versus 1.8, and their size are very close as well. So the based on Hume root three rules, um, they have high mutual solubility, but based on experiments, the nickel and copper system are totally soluble in one another, or it has unlimited solid solubility. So that will result in a special phase diagram, which is the isomorphous phase diagram. And this is the phase diagram for the copper nickel system. So if this title is not given, typically the copper and nickel, the two components will be written on the bottom or on the composition axis. One side will be copper, one side will be nickel. And in this given phase diagram, the horizontal axis is showing as the weight percent of nickel um, of course, because we only have two components, the weight percent of copper will be 100 minus the weight percent of nickel. And the vertical axis is the temperature axis, showing the temperature in degree Celsius. And in the different regions, we have the phases. So this phase diagram maps the phases as a function of 
in temperature and composition, and also pressure. But typically, the pressure will not change. Uh, so most phase diagram is plotted at one atmosphere atmosphere so p is not a variable we only need to change the temperature and composition and to figure out at the given temperature and composition what are the phases present and this is a binary system because it has two components the copper and nickel so every um each Phase diagram that has only two components or consists of only two components are called a binary system. And again, the independent variables will be the temperature and composition, and phases will depend on the given temperature and composition. So there are three different phase regions or fields appear on this diagram. An alpha field a liquid field and a two-phase field. This two-phase field is L liquid plus alpha. So again, there are two phases overall. One phase is liquid phase and solid phase, which is alpha phase, which is FCC solid solution or FCC copper nickel solid solution. And between the liquid and solid phase, between this, the, the, the region in between the two is the alpha plus liquid region. So there are three different phase regions, liquid region, liquid plus alpha region, and alpha region. So this liquid L is a homogeneous liquid solution composed of both copper and nickel. And this liquid region extends all the way from 0% of nickel to 100% of nickel when the temperature is above the liquidest line. And the alpha phase is the substitutional solid solution consists of both copper and nickel. And it's the copper nickel solid solution has an FCC crystal structure. So at temperature below, about the uh, below the solidest line copper and nickel are mutually soluble in each other in the solid state for all the compositions so that's why we only have one solid solution phase we don't have a separate or new composition or new structure formed under this solidest line and now on the vertical line if you take a closer look at uh, one side, for example, at this side, when the composition is 0% of nickel, we have 100% of copper at the left line, and this temperature is actually the melting point of copper. So now if we just take a look at this line, one dimensional line, right, it will be easier to understand that below the melting point will have solid copper and above the melting point we have the liquid copper. And same idea on the other side, on the uh, right side or right boundary, if we have 100% of nickel which will have 0% of copper, now this point will be the melting point point of nickel. All right, that means for solid solution, we, don't, we do not have a specific melting temperature, but we have a re region for, uh, for the, the uh, alloy to melt. So we said this is, system is called a binary phase diagram because we have two components, copper and nickel. How about isomorphous? Well, isomorphous means complete solubility of one component in another. So if you take a look at the alpha phase, so which is the solid solution? So solid solutions are commonly designated by lowercase Greek letters starting from alpha. And then if you have a next phase, we'll call it beta phase and gamma phase and so far so on. So if there's only one solid solution, then it will be called the alpha phase. So this alpha phase field 
field extends from zero, one zero uh, weight percent of nickel to one hundred percent uh, weight percent of nickel. That means no matter how much nickel we put into copper, if the copper is the host material, then there's only one solid solution formed. There is no second phase formed, or there's no precipitate out. So that means it's um, completely solubility, and that is why it's this kind of phase diagram is called the isomorphous binary phase diagram. Now for the phase boundaries, the two lines between the three regions, the, the line between the liquid and liquid plus alpha region is labeled as the liquidus line. And the line, the blue line between the liquid plus alpha region and the alpha region is labeled as solidus line. So what are the significances of those two lines? First of all, for the liquidus line, above this liquidus line, we see all liquid present. So this liquid line also shows the temperature at which the first solid begins to form during solidification process. So for example, if we have an alloy or copper nickel alloy with a composition of 20% uh, of nickel and 80% of copper. So we need to form this alloy by cooling it down, so it solidifies into solids. So let's say if we cool it down from 1300 degrees Celsius, so at this temperature everything is liquid because this point is located within the liquid region, and we, we slowly cool it down, so it's still now everything is liquid because it's still in the liquid region and it's still liquid over here until it reaches this liquidus line. So this line, let's say, is about at about 1200 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, the first alpha solid start to form within the liquid. Okay, so that line gives you the temperature um, for the first solid to form during solidification. And if you choose another composition, like 40% nickel, and the temperature for the first solid to form will be different. Again, if you draw that line and the, the line where it intercepts this liquidus line, um, the corresponding temperature will be the temperature for the first solid to form in the material. So that's the liquidus line. That's between the liquidus and the two phase region. And next, for the solidus line, it's kind of the similar idea. So below this line, only solid phase is present. In this case, only alpha phase is present below this solidus line. So the solidus line also tells us some temperature. It is the temperature below which all liquid has completely solidified. So if we use the same example at 20% of nickel alloy, and again, starting to cool it down from 1300 degrees Celsius with all liquid, first of all, and uh, when it reaches 1200 degrees Celsius, the first solid start to form. And now again, the melting temperature is not a single temperature for alloys, but it melts within a range, or there's a temperature range, uh, so it will melt over the range. So, gradually cool it down, and more solids start to uh, start to form, and we have less liquid. And again, more solids start to form, we have less liquid, until we reach the solidus line. At this point, the last drop of the liquid is solidified into solid. So everything turns into solid at this temperature, which is about 1,150. In addition to the phases present at the given temperature, we can also find the phase composition and phase amount when given the overall composition and the temperature.
So those two terms are very confusing. So we need to tell them apart before we can figure out the values for them. So the phase composition is the amount of each component present in a particular phase. It tells you something about a particular phase. For example, if you have two phases, alpha phase and beta phase, or two solid um, two parts, right? Two portions in in the uh, in the system alpha and beta. So the phase composition refers to the alpha phase or the beta phase. So it's not a comparison between the two phases, but it's for a particular phase. Another example can be. Uh, for sugar partially dissolved in water with two phases, the syrup and the, which is the liquid and the solid sugar. Those are the two phases, right? So the phase composition of liquid phase or the syrup at room temperature means the component present in a particular phase. So it's 61% of sugar and 35% of water. And we can also get the phase composition of the solid, which is sugar, so which is 100% of sugar. So that's the phase composition. For the phase amount, is the amount of each phase in the total mixture. It tells you about all the phases present in a system. So the system or the object of the study is the entire system instead of the each phase within the system. So if you use the same example, the mixture has a phase amount of 50% of liquid phase and 50% of solid phase. For example, if we have the same uh, sugar partially dissolved in water, with a whole cup, we can have 50% of syrup over 50% of the solid sugar. So that's the phase amount. Liquid and solid phase are the two phases, whereas the um, sugar and water are the two components in a single phase. For a binary system of known composition and temperature at equilibrium, at least three kinds of information are available. The first is the phases that are present. The second is the compositions of each phase. The third is the phase amount. So let's take a look at the first case. If we know the temperature and the overall composition C0, then we can find which phases are or which phase is present. So the procedure is kind of a relative simple. Let's use two examples to see how to identify the phases. So at point A, we have the temperature, which is 1. 1,100 degrees Celsius and the composition is 60% of nickel. And we find that temperature composition point on the diagram and notes the phase or the phases with which the corresponding phase field is labeled. So now point A is in the field labeled as alpha or FCC solid solution. So at this given temperature and overall composition, we only have one phase, which is alpha phase. Another example, point B at 1250 degrees Celsius and 65% of nickel. Again, we locate this temperature composition point on the diagram and notes the phases with which the corresponding phase field is labeled. So now it's landed in the L liquid plus alpha phase region. Therefore, at this given, um, given pair of temperature and composition, we have two phases, which are liquid plus alpha. The second information we can get is the composition of each phase 
for, of course, first we need to identify uh, what face or what faces are present at the given temperature and uh, overall composition, and then we can identify or get the composition information for each face. For example, let's use C0 at 35% of nickel, so which means we have an overall composition of um, we have 35% of nickel and 65% of copper, so that's a mixture of uh, copper and nickel. And then at TA, which is 1320 degrees Celsius, we locate this temperature composition point, point A. Now at point A, we can find the composition of the phase. So we know at point A, we only have one phase which is the liquid phase. Therefore, the composition of a liquid phase is the composition of the, or the overall composition. So, since we only have liquid phase, C sub L, which is the composition of the liquid, okay, again, it's C sub L equals to C sub zero, which is the overall composition, which are the same. It's 35% of nickel. And now at a different temperature, let's say at TD, which is below the solidus line, uh, which is 1190 degrees Celsius, and this is the point D. So point D well, it's landed in the single alpha region, therefore we only have alpha solid at the given temperature and overall composition point D. Uh, same idea, right? Since we only have solid phase, alpha phase present, so the alpha phase composition is the overall composition. C alpha equals to C zero, which is 35%. Okay, so next, if we change the temperature, so it is between the liquidus and solidus temperature at point B, um, about 1250 degrees Celsius, right here. So now we have two phases present, the alpha phase and alpha, uh, liquid phase. Now if we have two phases, right, we need to find the composition of each phase which means the composition of the liquid phase and the composition of the alpha phase. Well, to do that, first, we need to draw a tie line pass through this point B or a tie line at the given temperature. So this is the tie line at the given temperature. So this tie line will intercept with the liquidus and the solidus line on both liquidus and solidus lines and again that's uh that's the line at the given temperature and meet with liquidus and solidus lines and now from those interceptions we drop a perpendicular line to the composition axis so the interception ways of the tie line with the liquidus line this point the x-axis corresponds to the liquid composition or the composition of the liquid phase. So C sub L is 32% of nickel in this case. And same idea, the interception of the tie line with the solidus line, from this interception we drop a perpendicular line to the composition axis and this composition axis indicates the composition of the solid phase, which is the alpha phase. And in this example, the, alpha, the composition of the alpha phase is 43 with percent of nickel. So to summarize the method we used to find the phase compositions, here are the steps. First, we draw a line through point of interest parallel to the composition axis that stops at the liquidus and solidus line. And this is the tie line. 
sometimes called the isotherm because it's at a given temperature, and this line indicates a constant temperature line. Second, the composition of the liquid phase is rid of the composition axis from where the tie line hits the liquid line, which is the C sub L in the figure. So C sub L is the uh, symbol for liquid composition or composition of the liquid phase. And the composition of the solid phase is rid of the composition axis from where the tie line hits the solid line, which is the C sub alpha in the figure. Using this time line, we can also find the phase amount or the fraction of each phase if we have more than one phases. So if we use the same example at point B, we know we have two phases, liquid phase and alpha phase. We already figured out the phase composition for each phase. C sub L is the composition for the liquid phase, and C sub alpha is the composition of the solid phase or alpha phase. And using all of those informations, we can find the phase amounts using the lever rule. Again, the phase amount refers to how much of liquid phase do we have and how much of the alpha phase do we have if we have a mixture of liquid and alpha phase. Um, is it 50 to 50 or is that 40 to, 50, uh, to 60? So which phase do we have more? Okay. So again, think of this tie line as a lever and then to apply this lever rule to find the phase amount. So the lever rule is like uh, to write an equilibrium equation for moment or an equilibrium moment equation about this point B. So this is the lever. On the left side, we have liquid or the amount of the liquid. On the right side, we have the amount of the solid phase. And this reference point is the overall composition, uh, point B. So this point is equivalent to the point B on the phase diagram. Again, that's B corresponds to the overall composition point C sub zero. And the moment arm of each portion is alpha and S respectively. Moment arm, right, we know, is the distance from this point to the reference point and the distance from the M sub alpha to the reference point. Now, to write the moment equilibrium equation, we know this, if we assume that's the weight of the liquid phase, ML, and this is the weight of the solid phase, M sub alpha. So this M sub, sub alpha will cause a clockwise rotation about point B, and the magnitude is m alpha times s and the liquid phase will cause a counterclockwise rotation about point b and the magnitude is m sub l times r and again to have an equilibrium about point b means we don't want to have any rotation now the overall moment should be zero so sum of the moment about point b is zero, and this is the equation we get from the moment equilibrium. And why do we have this equation? Well, this equation can be used to, to convert the phase amount equation to a simple, simpler version. Okay, so again, that's the relation between the um, mass of the liquid phase and the mass of the solid phase. Now, the phase amount for the liquid phase, weight percent, okay, weight percent of the liquid phase, W sub L, equals to the mass of the liquid phase over the total mass, which is the sum of liquid plus the alpha phase. And now if you substitute the equation we just get from the lever rule to this equation, you can either express the M sub alpha in terms of M sub L, S, and R, or you can 
you can uh, exp express the M sub L in terms of M sub alpha and S and R. And after transform transformation, this is the equation we get. Okay, so I will skip the um, derivation from this step to this step. Okay, if you're interested, please, um, you can do the calculation by yourself to see how do we convert, how do we transform uh, the weight percent equation from uh, using the mass to the distances amount to the distances s and r okay all right so s is the distance of this is the distance from the point b to the solidus line and uh, this r is the distance from point b to the liquidus line on this phase diagram if you take a closer look so this is r the green portion, the left portion of this tie line, and this is the S, which is the right portion of this tie line from the point B. And those two terms, S and R, can be expressed in terms of the composition. So S equals to C sub, R, C sub alpha minus C sub zero. And R plus S, which is the length of the entire tie line, is C sub alpha minus C sub L. So overall, this weight percent of liquid phase, or the phase amount of liquid phase in terms of the mass fraction, equals to the tie line on the opposite portion of the liquid S over the entire tie line and expressed in the com phase composition is C sub alpha minus C sub zero over C sub alpha mi minus C sub L. And same idea for the weight percent or phase amount of the alpha phase equals to R over the entire length of the tie line where R is C sub zero minus C sub L and entire tie line again is C sub alpha minus C sub L. Okay, so just remember you are using the opposite portion of the tie line over the entire tie line to calculate the phase amount of a single phase. By saying the opposite tie line, I mean, for example, for the weight percent of the alpha or of the liquid phase. So the liquid phase is over here, right? That's the point where the tie line hits the liquid line. But in calculation of the weight percent of the liquid phase or phase amount of the liquid phase, we actually used this portion, the S. Right, the opposite portion to the liquid part, this part over the entire length of the tie line. That is the weight percent or phase amount of the liquid phase. And same idea for the solid phase, for the alpha phase. And alpha phase is supposed to be on this side of the tie line, on the right end of the tie line. However, when we calculate the phase amount for alpha phase, we used the opposite portion, R, over the entire length of the tie line. Now let's use the lever rule we just figured out to find the weight fraction of each phase or the phase amount of each phase for the three points A, B, or A, B and D points. So use the same overall composition, which is 35 weight percent of nickel, um, C sub zero, it's 35 weight percent of nickel. So now at point A, we only have liquid phase, right? So that means the weight percent of liquid is 100% and the weight percent of alpha phase is zero since we only have liquid phase. And now at TD, same idea, we only have solid phase, therefore the weight percent of 
liquid phase is zero and we percent of alpha phase will be one or 100 percent now at point b we're going to use a lever rule to find the weight percent of liquid which is the opposite portion of the tie line over the entire tie line and this s equals to 43 c sub alpha 43 minus c sub 0 35 and the whole tie line is c alpha minus c sub l which is 43 minus 32. so the weight percent of the liquid phase is about 73 percent or 0.73 the rest of the portion will be alpha phase so it's one minus Alpha phase can be calculated by using 1 minus the weight percent or weight fraction of the liquid phase, which will give us 0.27. The phase diagram can also tell us something about the microstructure. So now let's consider the microstructure change during the cooling of a nickel copper alloy, which contains 35 weight percent of nickel. At point A, above the liquidus line, we have all liquid, and this liquid contains 35 weight percent of nickel and 65 weight percent of copper. So solidification begins when the liquid reaches the liquidus temperature at point B. So at this point, the first solid start to form. So those are the first solid formed in the liquid. And using the tie line, we see that this solid has 46 weight percent of nickel and about 54% uh, of copper, where, whereas the liquid still have 35 weight percent of nickel. So now if we continue to cool this alloy at point C, solidification has advanced and the phase diagram now using another tie line at this temperature at about 1250 degrees Celsius. This tie line tells us now all of the liquid contain 32% of nickel and all of the solid contain 43% of nickel. So the weight percent of nickel in solid decreases from 46 to 43. And in the liquid, then the composition or the weight percent of the nickel also decreased from 35% to 32%. So that is because on cooling from the liquid from point B to point C, some nickel atoms must diffuse from the first solid to the new solid, reducing the nickel in the first solid. Additional nickel atoms diffuse from the solidifying liquid to the new solid as well. Now this process must continue until we reach the, the solidus temperature, which is at point D, where the last liquid phase or solidify. And the, this last liquid contains 24% of nickel, which solidifies and forms a solid containing a copper of about 36% of nickel. And then move on to just below this solidus line. All the solids must contain a uniform concentration of 35% of nickel throughout. The microstructure depends both on the phases that are present as shown on the phase diagram and how the phases form as the material is cooled from the liquid to solid. At each step, of the cooling process, the microstructure evolves from the microstructure that was present at the higher temperature 
and so it must be consistent with the previous microstructure. Nuclei form and grow as temperature lower down. Generally, the process of solidification is first that small particles form and then grow larger until no liquid is left. Based on the cooling rate, we can have equilibrium cooling and non-equilibrium cooling. For equilibrium cool cooling, the result will be equilibrium structures. Uh, for non-equilibrium cooling, the result will be cord structures. So let's explain the formation of the equilibrium and cord structures. So for equilibrium cooling, we know solidification in the solid plus liquid phase occurs gradually upon cooling from the liquid line. And then the composition of the solid and the liquid change gradually during cooling as can be determined by the tie-line method. So based on the tie-line method, the first solid to solidify has a composition of 46 weight percent of nickel and the last alpha to solidify has the composition of 35 weight percent of nickel. And to have this equilibrium structure, we need to give it enough time for diffusion to happen. In other words, the cooling rate should be very, very slow. So nuclei of the solid phase form and they grow to consume all the liquid at the solidus line and also the um, the copper atoms and the nickel atoms can diffuse to reach this equilibrium structure. So that's the slow rate of cooling equilibrium structure. Now for non-equilibrium cool cooling, the composition of the liquid phase evolves by diffusion. Followed, following the equilibrium value that can be derived from the Tylen method. However, diffusion in the solid state is very slow. So the new layer that solidify on top of the grains have the equilibrium position at that temperature, but once they are solid, their composition does not change. So this is what is going to happen for when the cooling rate is too fast and uh, is we don't have enough time or the solid doesn't have enough enough time to diffuse and it will form a cord structure so layers of layers of the solid are formed but as soon as they are formed they cannot change anymore so the composition of each layer is kind of um, composition is is decreasing from the first formed alpha has forty six percent of nickel to the last alpha which only has a less than thirty five weight percent of nickel again because the fast cooling uh, there's no time for diffusion to happen or the time is not sufficient. We have previously mentioned that a copper nickel alloy will be stronger than either a pure copper or pure nickel because of the solid solution strengthening. The mechanical properties of a series of copper nickel alloys are given here relative to a phase diagram. So we have the change of the tensile strength with the change of composition, change of the yield strength with the change of composition, and the percentage of elongation, which represents the ductility of the material. So we can see that copper is strengthened by up to 60% of nickel. So because from uh, from uh, x equal to zero or from copper weight percent of nickel equal to zero to about 60 percent the tensile strength of the copper nickel alloy increases or we can also say the nickel is strengthened by up to 40 percent of copper adding copper and the tensile strength into nickel the tensile strength will increase first and then decrease at about 40 percent of copper 
So we can use this information to choose the right material. For example, if we need to produce a copper nickel alloy having a minimum yield strength of 20,000 psi, tensile strength of 60,000 psi, and at least of 20% of elongation. So using this given di uh, graph, we know that uh, this is the 20,000 psi of yield strength. So we want the yield strength to be above 20 thousand so it must be between kind of between those two points and for the tensile strength is sixty thousand so this is above sixty thousand in between those two compositions therefore we need to find the the cross parts so which means this are the common compositions, right, to meet both the yield strength and tensile, str tensile strength requirement. And for the percentage of elongation, it must be above 20. So this is the percentage of elongation uh, line on the right. Therefore, it must be above 20. So this is the 20 line. And this part is above 20. So now, the valid choice or the choice that satisfies all of the conditions would be only this portion. So it's about 40, 44 to 55 percent of nickel in copper will meet the requirement for this copper nickel alloy.